Hey Pittsburgh, it's Megan. One of my all-time favorite events in the city is coming up soon, Arborade, benefiting, of course, Tree Pittsburgh. There's going to be delicious food and drinks and live music from a couple wonderful Pittsburgh acts. But my favorite part is knowing that I'm helping support our shared urban forest. Tree Pittsburgh does so much great work in our community, from tree giveaways to education. And let's be honest, they've got one of the cutest mascots in the game. Plan to party with us at Arborade. That's Saturday, September 16th from 5 to 9 p.m. And definitely check their website. There are ticket options for every budget. Find more at treepittsburgh.org. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, Century 3 Mall is condemned, but that does not mean it's getting demolished, at least not yet. But it is kind of an eyesore, and it's pretty unsafe. And if it's not possible to bring it back to life anymore, what should happen next? It's Monday, August 14th. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. Matthew Newton, welcome to CityCast. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you for having me, Megan. You literally wrote the book on shopping malls some years ago. It's actually on my bookshelf downstairs. It's a really beautiful little book called Shopping Mall. I know you studied all kinds of spots all over the country, but Century 3 was part of your childhood. What was it like to learn that it had been condemned? Yeah, I mean, it's always bittersweet because in in the book, I get into a lot of like my uh, sort of have a love-hate relationship with malls. (laughs) <laughs> of course, it's more the older I get, the more it's a love. It's relation. loving criticism. Yeah, it's it's um. It, I think the the love sort of like grows as I get older because of course as they as they fall, you know, one by one it seems like. But yeah, Century Three Mall definitely the the news of it being condemned was was definitely like. I mean, everybody knew it was going to happen, but it's like, I don't think we knew that like all the terrible things that have been sort of, you know, happening in recent months with like arson and all these different things that have happened in the mall. So it's yeah, yeah it's a little it's a little definitely a little bittersweet, you know. Well, I mean, it felt like there was going to be some hope. You know, Moonbeam Capital, this company based out of Vegas, bought it in 2013 with all these promises to fix it up. And it turns out they've done that dozens of times all over the country from what I read. Um, it seems like they really let them fall to pieces like Century 3. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I'd heard the name Moonbeam for, you know, off and on for years, uh, probably originally when they bought the malls when I first, they were first on my radar. But yeah, it, it, I think they have about almost a dozen malls across the country. So um, it seems to mostly be East Coast and Midwest. But um they have a history, it seems, of either you know not paying taxes or promising big developments when they you know buying a mall like a Century Three and promising like this rejuvenation effort and then um, yeah leaving their properties just unfortunately to kind of uh, to languish until they get to the point like Century Three where you know there's water pouring in the ceiling and you know it's it's beyond essentially beyond repair and have you been inside Century Three lately? I have not actually. I it's one of those things I've wanted to do, uh, and uh, <laughs> I actually have a uh, my uh, my seventeen year old son Ethan was like that would be pretty cool, and I was like yeah, like the, the, the like the dad instinct had to kick in. I was like we we probably shouldn't go in there, um, <laughs> <laughs> and also admittedly I've you know I've heard some some crazy stories about it just from people you know, want to share their mall stories with me. And none of this is like reported, of course, but it's just things that people have told me, which I think have become this sort of weird, like local myth making, like, no, I love normal gossip. Keep going. Yeah. And there's like, you know, supposedly um, there's people like, you know, people were like living in, you know, there'd be like people like kind of camping out there overnight. And there would be people like, you know, there was, you know, a friend's son actually told me this story. He heard of, you know, someone walking around there and like, Basically, I don't know if they were using like a BB gun or a shotgun, but just shooting, shooting storefront windows. And I mean, something happened to some of those windows because I've seen the photos of the glass everywhere. Yeah. And like, so I don't know exactly like, uh, but it's funny because it all becomes this sort of like urban legend, you know, uh, like kind of that, that sort of, yeah, like, like this sort of just gossip, you know, that you don't know like what's true and what's not. It seems like it's becoming sort of a pilgrimage spot for folks that like to see old relics like this. I mean, that I, I, from my perspective, it seems like maybe that's part of the problem. Like a bunch of YouTubers were charged with criminal trespassing not long ago. You mentioned arson. There was that fire in April. Um, and then a high school student from West Mifflin fell through the roof while filming a TikTok in June. Um, luckily, he's OK, but he fractured his back and punctured his lung. Like these are not small injuries. Yeah, when I heard about that, I was sort of like, oh, my God, like I, of course, once again, like just 
as a human, but also as a parent, it's like, you don't want to hear about people falling, you know, two stories inside of a dead mall. I mean, that's not, that's not ideal, but my goodness. I mean, I think the other thing that sort of sticks out to me too, is that, um, I think definitely it became like a pilgrimage site for like urban explorers and folks who consider themselves like kind of YouTube personalities. But I also think what's interesting about that is like some of those folks are super meticulous in their prep for those sorts of things. And they have like, you know, they know about the idea of like, you know, structural integrity being, you know, like compromised and they're, they actually, yeah. they actually consider that. And then other folks going in, they're not considering it. Like, like this recent group that you said, like how they, I think they were just all, they were all um, charged, right? With, um, yeah. And so, yeah, which I think is the first example I've seen. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but you know, of, of this recent cropping of folks trying to go in there, like there's yeah. always relics in Pittsburgh and people kind of crawl around them slowly, carefully, but I guess these got caught. Yeah, no, I, I actually thought that too when it when it happened. I I kind of got the sense with this latest group that they just thought, oh, well, this is totally fine because obviously it's all over YouTube. And then, well, and people were doing it with permission. You know, it was the set for some movies. Uh, there were some interesting art artist residencies there where folks were just kind of creating in the space. I was never clear on whether all of that was happening with with full permission, but I mean, I assume at least the film sets, for example, had to have been the insurance needed it. Yeah, the the artist collectives that were working in there. Um, that was on the mall. Was still open and they definitely had permission i actually think they paid rent they might have actually paid rent to like rent a storefront for a wow, while okay yeah and then there were some holdouts too that comic book store was there forever oh yeah you got to give a shout out to a uh, new dimension for because uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that that store is like was incredible i mean i'm also a comic book nerd so like i really like appreciate that store but um i'm not a comic book nerd and i still appreciated that store it was just it was so good at what it did yeah and, and what's funny is um that that location that you know that was that store that used to be in century three relocated to the waterfront and um, right. i overhear conversations still like when i'm at that location of people saying <laughs> like oh what why, why'd you guys you know why did you leave them all when you did and, and basically they were just like we were like one of the last people to leave. you know we're like one of the last stores to leave so like we they said but you know it was no heat in winter no no air conditioning in summer like for the last i don't know it was like three yeah, or four I years bet. so it's it's it is interesting that um all of us have had bad landlords, but I think maybe they take the cake. Yeah, I think uh, I think Moonbeam not it was not um, paying all the bills, I guess, or something, you know. So it's hey Pittsburgh, it's Megan. If you're craving a delicious scoop on a hot summer day, get yourself up to Bakery Square. It's the new local home for Jenny's ice cream in Pittsburgh. I know, I know, it's sort of sacrilegious here to love an Ohio brand this much, but y'all, I've been a Jenny stan for years. Their flavors are so creative. The brown butter almond brittle, the brambleberry crisp, the darkish chocolate. They have dairy-free and gluten-free options too, and they'll be dropping new flavors every week now through August 10th. I am so stoked that I can finally get my from scratch Jenny's Fix right here in Pittsburgh at Target, Whole Foods, even Giant Eagle. Find all their flavors and fun facts at Jenny's, that's J-E-N-I-S dot com. Hey Pittsburgh, it's Megan. One of my all-time favorite events in the city is coming up soon, Arborade, benefiting, of course, Tree Pittsburgh. There's going to be delicious food and drinks and live music from a couple wonderful Pittsburgh acts. But my favorite part is knowing that I'm helping support our shared urban forest. Tree Pittsburgh does so much great work in our community, from tree giveaways to education. And let's be honest, they've got one of the cutest mascots in the game. Plan to party with us at Arborade. That's Saturday, September 16th from 5 to 9 p.m. And definitely check their website. There are ticket options for every budget. Find more at treepittsburgh.org. Well, so take us back to the mall's early days. What was it like when it originally opened um, in its heyday? Yeah, well, it's, it's a super Pittsburgh story, which pretty much... Mo- <laughs> we love like, those. Well, yeah, right. And uh, as many stories uh, in Pittsburgh, in any sort of real estate development, it starts with being the site of, you know, a former site that U.S. Steel owned. U.S. Steel actually had its own realty division, which I recently found out whenever I was kind of like looking back at some things. And it's like they actually owned the site and they were looking to do something with it. And it was actually um, a slag heap, which is just like the cast off from, you know, working with iron ore and basically like, you know, making steel and iron. And um, and, and I didn't realize it was as old as it was. I was reading about it. 1979 was originally when it was built and opened. Yeah, it opened in 1979. I believe they um, I believe U.S. Steel, like a, about a decade earlier is when they started 
basically the slag heap was actually called Brown's Dump, which I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> but uh, and it was about 200 feet tall, from what I understand. And it was almost like a little mini slag mountain, I guess. And um, literally train cars used to pull up to it and pour slag onto it. And it would be supposedly at night. It sort of had like a glow when it got when that happened. Um, oh, my gosh. So it, was, it went from that to being flattened for, you know, it took several years, I guess, for them to sort of really like get the site prepared. But yeah, 1976 construction started for Century 3 and then it opened in 1979. So it's actually not like in that first wave of malls by any stretch. You know, it's it's definitely when malls were already becoming like a huge deal, like all across the country. But um, well, and I know from your book that, you know, a lot of malls had like uh, some kind of special kitschy thing that they like hung their hat on, um, you know, something that was exciting about this location versus that one. Um, what was Century 3's thing? Well, I actually always thought Century 3 meant that they had three levels, which they do have three levels. But the third level was, well, not, you know, when it was in its heyday, uh, the three, le- <laughs> the third level when you went in was like literally like it was only like two stores, and then you just went down escalators. But turns out, uh, just actually just reading about it again recently, it, it was around since it was around the time of the centennial bicentennial, like 1976. Mm-hmm. It actually uh, C three stands for like just the th- like the third century of the United States, which you know, like it does. That's what it's like. I guarantee you, most of Pittsburgh has no idea that that was supposed to be the connection point. I don't. I think it's a really bad branding <laughs> situation because I don't think anybody would make that connection. So, but otherwise, yeah, it was it was um, developed by the um, Edward J. D. Bartolo Corporation, uh, who actually had you know s- several malls across the country. But they uh, they really Century Three was a pretty big undertaking at the time because I believe when it opened, it was like the uh, third largest mall in the world. Wow! But all the I feel like they were that was like a selling feature for any time a mall <laughs> opened because it, it's like one point two million square feet or so. Like when it opened, um, mm-hmm. that's what I read too. Yeah. So I, I and that's you know there's there's now been probably you know dozens of malls bigger because you have of course like the American Dream Mall, New Jersey. You have you know you have these you know yeah. Mall of America. But yeah, so it it was a pretty big deal and especially. Um, over that way, you know, all those folks were looking at a, at a slag heap for many years. So you figure yeah. they were probably, and from what I understand, like in the run up to them leveling the space and actually putting the mall in, uh, that's when a lot of those businesses along 51 started to kind of pop up. Yeah. When well, your heyday for it would have been like the, what, mid to late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, I, I definitely bought my first pair of vans there, you know. Yeah, uh, I, well, so. I was going to ask, like, what was the vibe? <laughs> like, what, what was the fun thing to do? Yeah, that was, I was going to say that was the thing. It was sort of like, that was like the heyday of like, you know, everybody walking around in their little sort of like social groups, you know, uh, you know, you had like sort of like your gearhead folks, you had your jocks. You had, I mean, it was like the micro, it was like a larger microcosm, I guess, of like the of high school, you know, in the area. And of course, you had adults and everything there. But that's not what you were worried about when you were, you know, like a teenager, <laughs> people following their, their crushes or whatever. I mean, it was like the usual weird mall situation but it felt so <laughs> it just felt so exotic you know hey i mean i think it's like it's one of those weird like shared experiences so many american teenagers have of a certain era right like right that was just it was the place to be or it was the place you kind of wanted to be or like you know stuff would happen over there and if you weren't there then like oh my gosh um what do you think was the first sign then that century three was going downhill that you know this maybe isn't going to last forever well yeah it's interesting because um so Simon Property Group, who, uh, you know, is kind of like a fairly well-known, like, uh, mall sort of company. Yeah, I think they still have Ross Park Mall, don't Ross they? Ross Park Mall, which is actually a super good example of, like, uh, Simon, a Simon Property and what they normally do. Like, they, they normally kind of start to bring in more upscale retail, like, you know, kind of big name, big national names like Nordstrom. Yeah, they've and got like, Burberry and yeah. uh, Louis Vuitton. Like, they're doing fine. Yeah, they're doing really great, actually, it seems like. Uh, it's like one of those malls where it's like, yeah, that's that if they've made it a pretty big destination. But Simon had it for a while and it seemed like it was going to be OK in like those tr- in the 2000s sort of. And then it it seems like it was like once once Simon sort of started to seem to lose interest, you know, like in the mall, like, it, it, yeah. I, and I, and I feel like they definitely seem like they understand malls and they were always like doing, you know, as a, as a mall sort of company were really, you know, like, you know, kind of on top of trends and things like that. And it's like almost like the death knell for a mall is often when you see independent businesses going in, which shouldn't be the way it is. It should be incredible that like the community actually is coming into the mall and being able to use it. But it's almost like always the, because the mall has such a, it has such a vacancy rate that like they're lowering rents and actually people like normal average, you know, independent businesses can afford then to actually mm-hmm. come, come into the mall. But then that's almost always the sign that like 
finances are bad because you know they're having that means the rent is low that means they've been dropping rent that means they have high uh high vacancy rates so it's it's almost like goes back to the origins of the mall whenever the malls are basically killing main streets and small towns um you know they're it's almost like yeah there's i don't know there's some sort of like weird poetry in there i don't know you know or like some but yeah yeah well so i guess as sort of a eulogy maybe um we saw where someone on reddit had asked people what they would like to see the mall become like if money were no object at all and it were up to all of us what could it be you know um 80 acres 200 stores six anchors 1.2 and a half ish million square feet can i read you a few of their ideas oh yeah i'd like to hear it (laughs) uh one of them was a lunar surface training center. That'd be incredible. A zombie-themed paintball arena slash movie theater where you could watch Romero films. Of course, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, A reverse escape room where you have to break into the building. (laughs) That's pretty good. (laughs) Um, A living human museum with the store size dioramas depicting a specific way of life. Oh, my God. These are all pretty great. They don't sound like they're going to make a lot of money, though, so that probably wouldn't. But yeah. I mean, let's just pause capitalism for a moment. Yeah. Uh, a Pittsburgh biodome where, let's see, we live off Turner's, Iron City's, Eaton Park Salad Buffet, um, indoor golf course included. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Affordable housing. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, maybe probably what's most likely to happen, let nature reclaim it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, yeah, I, I kind of love all of those. Really. <laughs> It'd be cool if Moonbeam would take anybody up on that. But yeah, guess... right. Well, I mean, I guess while we're dreaming, um, is there anything that you, you know, you hope for the site of where Century 3 used to be? Um, what's your what would be your big dream? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, w- I wouldn't mind seeing it get reclaimed by nature, quite honestly. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, obviously, in a more productive way, you know, I, li- I live in the east and, uh, you know, Churchill valley country club has turned into a greenway now like it was abandoned for years it was a abandoned golf course and it turned into a greenway that's actually kind of beautiful now i wouldn't mind seeing something like that where like you could have you know maybe you keep you keep like they did in oakland you keep like how they kept the back wall of forbes field intact you know keep keep a couple you know keep a couple sort of foundational or structural pieces of the mall intact that are sort of you know like and then start to like you know almost like not terraforming but whatever you call that like where they start to you know use the use the use the parking garages and things like that to start, you know, like green spaces. And I don't know, that, that'd be kind of incredible, but. Yeah. Maybe we'll get the parks conservancy on the horn. That'll be fun. Yeah. Matthew Newton is a writer and editor uh, who also works in art museum publishing. Thank you so much for talking to us. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. I really appreciate it. A fun update since we recorded this conversation, Moonbeam Capital has appealed the latest and largest fine levied against them by West Mifflin Borough. This one was $240,000. They imposed it on Moonbeam last month for failing to address all of those safety hazards. So now both parties will be going to court in October. West Mifflin has fined them in the past, and according to reports, Moonbeam did not pay those fines or address any of those problems either. A little more news before you go. The warden at the Allegheny County Jail is retiring at the end of September. Orlando Harper has held the post since 2012, and a search is already in motion. Harper has been criticized over the years for his handling of the 19 people who've died there while incarcerated. That's just since April of 2020. And also for not enforcing a ban on solitary confinement that was passed by voters. And Pittsburgh native Billy Porter has his eyes on the Homewood Coliseum. He's partnering with a local developer and celebrity chef, Rachel Ray, to bring back the roller rink and create a workforce and after-school training center for arts education, mostly film, theater, kitchen skills, that kind of thing. The Urban Redevelopment Authority stressed to reporters that the plan is still very much in its early stages. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. If you're liking the show, please tell someone, rate us, leave us a nice review, and make sure you're subscribed to that Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Talk to you in soon. If Century 3 does get demolished, what will Century 3 Chevrolet be minutes away from? Yeah, I guess uh, minutes minutes from the crater.